It's Friday, so it must be Friday Facebook Live with Tanya and the expert panel that we now see. Um, and we're happy to see all of you today. Um, I see we have a lot of people joining us already on the um, in the chat. So we're very excited to be streaming today um, for our regular monthly Facebook Live session. Um, as, uh, for those of you who have not watched before, my name is Tanya Friedman. Um, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Kinetics USA. We are a direct hire recruitment company and we help hospitals and nursing homes all over the US with the nursing shortage by bringing in internationally educated nurses. We've been doing this for many, many years. Um, and I'm very happy to be able to introduce our panel. Um, so Carl, do you want to go ahead and, and introduce yourself? And be before you do, I just want to congratulate you Thank I believe you. there's been some very exciting news in your world. You want to share with the, the forums? Okay. So I, I've had my own immigration firm, which specializes in healthcare professionals, nurses, and doctors for the past 35 years. And last week, uh, we joined a national firm called Clark Hill, which has offices in 25 cities across the U.S. and in some foreign countries and has specialists in, in, uh, in nurses and doctors in some of these other cities. So we're really, we're really happy about the new, uh, the new merger. Congrats, Carl. Congratulations, Carl. Yeah, that's great, Carl. Congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got an email alert about this a week ago. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah I, thought, I thought about it a week ago as well. <laughs> well, you, well, Carl is famous, right? I know. <laughs> Jacob? <laughs> so uh, my name is Jacob Sapochnik. I'm an immigration attorney in San Diego, California, and uh, you know we we um, we are a boutique law firm. We specialize in um, um, you know healthcare as well, but we do a lot of uh, work with um, um, nurses directly with um, home care facilities and uh, all sort of immigration that is connected with startups. And uh, yeah, and I enjoy traveling and meeting my clients all over the world. Okay. Philippines is next. Wait, where are you today, yeah. Jacob? I'm at home today. Ah, yeah. sunny San Diego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And last but not least, Chris. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm Chris Masillo, and uh, yeah, I've been practicing in healthcare immigration since the 90s, uh, and uh, you know, I love working with uh, with the nurses. And so, uh, yeah, let's get right to the questions, Tanya. I know there's a lot of them. There's been a lot there's going on. There's a lot yeah. of questions this morning. Um, so first of all, I just want to welcome everybody who's watching. Um, Giselle from Saudi, Jeff from Dubai, um, Christian um, from the Philippines, Glenda, um, um, Athena from the Philippines. I'm not sure who, some, I, I, I can't read the writing, but also from the Philippines. Bernice from the Philippines, Milan is from the Philippines, Juna Lupus, Liz Tipa. Liz Tipa's got a question. And this is a burning question for many, many people watching this morning, um, which is the situation that's been happening in the Philippines with the 221G. Um, so um, this is, we have lots and lots of questions about this to our panel, but I'll read out Liz's question. Um, hers says, hi, Tanya, one of my co-RN uh, was interviewed just this morning. She did not receive the 221G letter, but the 221A5A letter outright and many of us are receiving 212A5A, two, 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 gosh, I need my glasses, <laughs> letters this week. It seems this is the trend now here in the US Embassy Manila. Can you discuss this letter with the panel uh, or return to the USCIS status? So this is a question that is, and, and this is really just for everybody to, you know, to know, this is the reason why we do these panel question and answers with the expert legal team, because there are so many things that are changing in the immigration world. And it's really important to educate yourself and keep up to date with that. Um, as I've said many times in this forum, I was an immigrant myself. I came to this country this year, it'll be 20 years ago. Um, and I know personally how hard that is. It's one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. Um, and I know that feeling of you know, at bed, lying in bed, wide awake, eyes staring at the ceiling and worrying. Um, so, and I see so many of you asking questions of each other in the panel, and this is your chance to ask the panels. 
the, in, ask the panel. So um, to everybody on the panel, if you want to share your thoughts about the situation, about the 221Gs and uh, answer Liz's question. I, I have some information. I think, uh, Tanya, maybe, maybe I'll start unless, unless Carl or Jacob want, want to start. Um, Go ahead, Chris. Right. So, so INA 212-5A, um, the letter that, that was referenced there, what that says is that a, uh, in order to get a green card, one must have a labor certificate. Uh, and uh, this appears to be a training issue at the Manila Consulate. Uh, labor certificates are actually not required for nurses. Uh, or physical therapists. They're required for just about every other occupation. So number one, if you're getting the 5A, that appears to be an error. There is a chance, however, that the embassy is tagging the refusal under 5A, but they're just sort of using that generally as a reason to deny the case, uh, because sort of the other leading theory as to what's happening over in Manila over the last six or eight weeks or so uh, is that there's been a misinterpretation about the validity of employment contracts. And of course, employment contracts are very much a part of this process. The recruiting industries simply, if they could not um, um, work with nurses from the Philippines to sign employment contracts, the recruiting agencies just, just wouldn't exist. No one is going to recruit a nurse if there's no guarantee that she's going to work for the facility in the United States for two or three years or whatever the contract is. That, that's sort of a necessary part of the process. I, I even think that the contract is in the nurse's be best interest. Again, if the contract, if there were not employment contracts, the entire immigration of nurses in the United States would be a trickle because all of the recruiters uh, just simply couldn't, they couldn't build a business around it. And it's actually the building of the business of recruiting and then placing and staffing, which is what allows the entire industry to, to thrive. So, so the second, so the first reason, again, just to reiterate, uh, could be, uh, or at least directly, A5 or 5A is the lack of a labor certificate. That, that is just simply a training issue. And then the second issue, which I actually think may be really driving this, is an issue with the Manila Embassy or the U.S. Embassy in Manila not understanding employment contracts. So that's all the bad news. The good news is I know a lot of us are working on this issue. Um, I've been in contact with probably a half a dozen U.S. Uh, congressional and senatorial offices over the last few weeks. Um, I've also been working with um, some folks that we do some lobbying in Washington, D.C. on. Um, they are actively engaged. I was on a conference call yesterday afternoon with about 15 different people, uh, and we're all laser focused on this issue. I think, you know, again, in terms of putting this in terms of good news and bad news, I'm optimistic that this will be solved. Over my career, I've seen the U.S. embassies, in particular Manila, because that's where we have a large part of our practice. We've seen Manila misinterpret rules, and what happens is, is when there's a large volume of people all going through the embassy, once the rule gets misinterpreted, it gets misinterpreted for dozens and dozens and maybe even 100 nurses, uh, as we've seen here. That's the bad news. The good news is these issues always get resolved, but Unfortunately, dealing with the U.S. government takes some time. We're putting a lot of pressure in, on, on the embassy. Uh, I've had uh, even an indirect conversation with someone actually in the Department of State in the administration in Washington, D.C., who as of earlier this week wasn't even aware that the embassy in Manila was doing this. And then compounding the entire problem is that there's currently not an immigrant visa chief at the embassy. That position remains unfilled which compounds the problem because there's not a boss there to correct everything. So again, that's all the bad news, but the good news is I am optimistic that this is going to get fixed uh, in, in the near term. In terms of what timeline, I have no idea. Could it happen next week? Sure. Could we still be dealing with this in April? I don't think so, but it's, but it's within the realm of possibility. I would suggest, however, that if you have an appointment in Manila in the next few weeks that you seek to postpone that because if you don't and you get your visa refused, it will get sent back to the service center where frankly, it will actually ultimately get reapproved and sent back to Manila. But that could take, I've seen it take as long as a year and, and maybe Jacob and Carl can speak to their experience with cases where the visa gets refused and then put, pushed back uh, to the service center. So I, I do think that if you're going through Manila, 
in the next few weeks that you consider postponing your appointment because there's no point going there okay. to either get your visa put into an administrative processing or worse yet, sent back to the Texas or Nebraska Service Center. And then the only other uh, item here is if you're going through another embassy, but you're listening in on this, so you're a Filipino who's going through maybe England, uh, the UK, London, or, uh, or the UAE, one of the Gulf countries, they're all fine there. Everything's coming through with, with no problem in any of those other embassies we haven't seen. Uh, so this problem seems entirely localized uh, to Manila. Yeah, that's what I was going to say that, you know, we have clients who go through other embassies and they don't have that issue. Yeah. But I can tell you that, uh, Chris, you know, this seems to be um, an issue with other embassies as well, where something happens and then everybody else copies. We have the same issue in Israel right now, where they're denying cases of E2 based on marginality because people are already have employees working for, for the company mm. and all the offices are doing the same thing. And I think we have the same issue here that cases get denied because somebody decided that they're gonna deny it for one reason and everybody else is following them. Uh, Paul, anything uh, to add? Yeah, I'm, well, I, you know, l lucky guy, I guess. I, I haven't had a single denial out of Manila. So I, I was just gonna ask Chris yeah. since he's been in, so involved with this, uh, Chris, uh, is this happening particularly with uh, outsourcing agencies or does it happen with direct employers as well? No, direct employers as well. We've got several hospital groups that have had several dozen cases put into administrative processing. I don't believe we've had any outright refused yet, though, but it's, right. it seems to be across the board, whether it's a staffing company or a direct placement company. My understanding, Carl, is that there was no case um, approved in the past 60 days. So you're saying you have cases approved in the past two months? Um, I, <laughs> usually we have a whole rush uh, going on. I can't right. tell you exactly, but we just had nobody, you know, nobody denied ever, ever in Manila. So I, I don't, right. um, I appreciate what's going on and getting a <laughs> heads up about this because I, I think we have some appointments coming up next week and the week after that. I don't think they dare to deny any of the Carl's cases. <laughs> <laughs> they know I'll sue them. I'll sue them. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It, it, it's a big worry for a lot of people. Um, and I think, as all of you have said, um, you know, it, it's something that comes up um, at, at consulates or, you know, we, we encounter these issues. But I think for everybody watching who's really worried about it and of course it is a big worry because it's very disheartening to go through this whole long journey and get to the end and then have this as the end result um, and you know you can feel you know everybody can feel very um you know very frustrated and they're very upset about it and um, but i think as chris had mentioned there is good news and and for everybody to know there's a lot of efforts in the u.s to rectify the situation um, from both the legislation, uh, legislative uh, perspective, um, a lot of the hospital systems. I mean, you know, we, we just, there, there are enormous um, uh, efforts going on. Carl, there's a lot of activity behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Sonia's trying to fix your light coming through. You're trying to fix the light coming through. <laughs> Is that better now? Or it's that, a little better. It's a little better. <laughs> It's a little better. Okay, so um, thank you everybody for your comments in that regard. We are hoping that we are hopeful that this um, situation will rectify itself soon. Just for you to know, there's a lot of efforts going on to help resolve it, um, and we'll keep everybody posted. Um, and as Chris also said, because we're getting a lot of these comments, a lot of people really worried if you're at another embassy, we don't seem to be having that kind of issue at all. So don't, you know, don't get too um, uh, worried about that. So I'm going to carry on in the questions. And um, okay, Bernice also asked about the refusal. So Bernice, I, think I, um, I know we've covered that one. Jeff is is online. Louise is watching. Hi, Louise. And thank you again to the Lafora team, Louise, Paul, Jean, etc., for giving us this opportunity. We're very grateful. Um, May, um, okay, is also asking about the 221G situation. Same from, um, okay, lots of people asking about the 221G. So um, we, I think we've covered that question and we'll keep you posted as things evolve here. Um, Okay, same question from Chris. Um, wow, Carl, congrats. 
coming from Cyrus. <laughs> Thank you, Cyrus. <laughs> um, okay. I'm just having a look. Okay. We want to talk about also, there's a question here from Dennis about the ban. And um, now I know most of the people in this, um, uh, in this forum are born in the Philippines, but there are actually some from other nationalities. And I know there are some from Nigeria. And um, so I'd like to ask the, the panel um, about the, uh, the new ban that came out. I think it was on Friday last week which includes Nigeria, because I think that's the one country that's been affected the most. So if we can maybe spend just like a minute or two on that one, um, and if you can give us your thoughts and updates on how you see that evolving. Carl. Well, uh, yeah, I, 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 haven't, I haven't had a case, so I, I, I haven't, um, actually somebody from your office, I have to get back, <laughs> back to them about how it's gonna affect Nigerian nurses. Uh, <clears throat> but if it's the same as the original countries with the travel ban, it, it prohibits people from getting immigrant visas if they're from these particular countries. Now there's 13 on the travel ban. Um, and unfortunately, I, I mean, I can't even sue him on this because the Supreme Court has already upheld the president's authority to bar people from the travel ban. So I guess the only the only good news that since we're on Lafora today is I very much doubt that the Philippines will ever ever be included on the travel ban. Um, you know, I'm sure Mr. Trump. If I'm sorry, but I, you know, I'm getting political. <laughs> <laughs> no could, politics. If, if, he could, if he could bar nurses from Mindanao, where my wife is born, <laughs> from coming in uh, mm -hmm. because uh, you know it's a uh, it's predominantly a Muslim in, in Mindanao. He could, but that the U.S. law doesn't work like that. He'd have to bar all Filipino nurses, so it's just not going to happen. Chris or Jacob, thank you, Carl. For uh, so anything, think, if they, I, there are some uh, nurses from Nigeria in the Lafora form, so anything right. specific in terms of Nigeria? So the thing is, what, what the, the ban is doing is predominantly the, um, banning people from getting green cards. Um, you know, people who come with non-immigrant visas. You know they have to um, you know case by case, but there's also waivers available. So these are hard to get, but people that you know are qualified uh, can apply for a waiver and still try to be able to do it. But it's definitely going to impact a lot of a lot of people from those countries. Yeah, that you know that's a good point that, that I forgot to mention, Jacob. Um, and the, the waivers, at least according to the statistics that I've read, have been get, given to less than two percent of the applicants. But I'm really happy to say we, we had a marriage case from uh, Iran a couple of weeks ago and we got our first waiver. So it is, oh, wow. it's, it's, it's rare, but it is possible to get a waiver. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris, did you have anything to add about? I mean, the only, the only thing I have to add is, you know, the ban does not go into effect until the 21st. And so if you have an appointment between now and two Fridays from now, you definitely do not want to miss that. Uh, a, B, if you have the visa, the I-551 stamp in your passport, we're advising that you travel. No, normally that's valid for six months from your, uh, from your visa appointment. So if you had your appointment on say, I don't know, January 15th, um, that's probably valid until July. We do recommend you travel before the 21st. That's my, my second point. And then my third point is that even though we're recommending you travel before the 21st, according to the actual proclamation, uh, you should actually still be able to enter after the 21st because you do have a valid, uh, a valid means of entry. Um, so, you know, if by some chance you can, you should travel by the 21st, if by some chance you absolutely cannot, then you should continue to try to attempt to enter because you, you should be granted entry because the ban is not supposed to apply to you. And then a couple other sort of uh, um, related points, I think, on the Nigeria ban. Uh, if you're in the United States on, let's say, a student status, we do see a lot of uh, Nigerian uh, student nurses here in the United States. You are still eligible to adjust your status in the United States. So the ban only applies to folks who are outside the United States. Um, and then my last point, is it unusually only applies to immigrants, which is to say green cards. 
uh, applicants. It does not actually apply to student visas and tourist visas and H-1B visas and a lot of these other uh, what we call non-immigrant or temporary visas. And so if you happen to be a student and you're listening in today and you're Nigerian, um, you know, you, you, you shouldn't have any problem re-entering the United States because, again, the ban does not apply to students. It only applies to permanent resident applications. So a few, a few uh, ancillary points there. And, and thanks, thanks for sharing that, Chris. And I think just to finish off this Nigeria question, we had a, um, a nurse. She's born in Nigeria, but a Canadian citizen. So she is okay to come in on the TN visa, right? Yeah, that's a good point. If she's yeah. Canadian, she should be able to just show the Canadian passport. Okay. okay. All right. So moving on. Um, okay. So let me just see. So Co Timzy, we already answered the question about the two two one G. Lots of questions about the two two one G. I know everybody is really worried about that. And um, I'm going to move to one of the questions that was um, that Louise posted um, previously, and was it was sent to me directly. Um, it's about the public charge, um, the, the Supreme Court ruling that I think it was last, when was it, last Monday? 27. Um, there was also, you know, at the end of last year, there was a lot of talk about um, nurses having to have uh, health insurance within 30 days um, of entering the country. And that was blocked in, I think it was in the, was it in the federal court? Yeah, it was in the uh, federal court. court. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now that the, the Supreme Court um, has um, passed the legislation on public charge, does that in any way affect the nurses that, uh, will, will, will nurses need to have health insurance within 30 days of arriving? Was no. Is that going to be... Good? Yeah, uh, yeah, so that's it, another it, question that's yeah, coming it, to It's you. confusing, but there's two separate lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So the, the lawsuit that was uh, blocking the Trump administration from... Um, enforcing the public charge rule. By the way, it's not, <laughs> it's not decided by the courts yet, but while it's being decided, the court said, we're gonna have an injunction. We're gonna prevent the administration from enforcing the public charge rule until you know a couple of years from now when we decide the case. And the, the administration took that all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, they can enforce the public charge rule starting on February 24th, new applications filed after February 24th, while this lawsuit goes on. And we're not saying whether it's gonna win or whether it's gonna lose, but in the meantime, they can enforce it. However, there's a separate lawsuit against the 30-day uh, uh, health insurance ban, okay? And that is still enjoined. So I, I would tell all the nurse, I've told all my nurses, just take a deep breath right now because there's, you don't have to worry about having health insurance within 30 days, but it's, it's mainly, you know what, who, I, I mean, technically, you know, it applies to everybody coming into the US, but, you know, nobody's going to be denied on a public charge ground who's, you know, making over $50,000 a year to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be focusing on family people who have taken certain government benefits. Their kids got free lunches fund funded by the federal government. They were on SNAP, which is food stamps or Medi-Cal, which is uh, health insurance and so on. <clears throat> And those people really have to worry. They really have to get their applications in before February 24th. But it, it, at least until there's some change in the health insurance uh, injunction, the nurses do not have to worry about it. And, and frankly, if, you know, I hope it doesn't happen, but if they remove the injunction on the health insurance thing, the, they'll just have to, the employers will have to get with it and make sure they offer all the nurses health insurance within their first 30 days or they won't be able to bring them to the U.S. And I think that the employers will do that because we have a huge shortage of nurses. Chris or Jacob, any comments on the health insurance issue or the public yeah, health? Yeah, so like, like, like we said before, it's, um, those two things are separate and people confuse them. But I think the, yeah. the biggest thing with the public charge to me is that they're shifting the burden from the US citizen petitioner 
to the applicant in a way, and they have all these tests about their age, about their health, about their education, which is going to make it very difficult for families to immigrate. So I think that's the kind of the biggest impact. Um, but it's not going to affect people who come here to work um, or study because they, they're already, already proving that they have money to come here. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with what yeah. Jacob and Carl are saying. I mean, just to put everyone's mind a little bit at ease, uh, even more so, that there's seven factors that they're going to look to with respect to the public charge. And we can just really quickly go through them. One is age. And if you're between 18 and 62, that cuts in, in your favor, which most of the nurses are going to be. So that's good. Two, if you're healthy, uh, uh, i.e. you're not in need of health care, uh, that also cuts in your favor, which for nurses, that's almost always going to be the case. Uh, your family status, they're going to look at your household size. Now, if it's you, a spouse, and 10 children, that, that could be a problem because you wouldn't need to show enough income. But as Carl says, you know, if, if you're in the fifty dollars or $60,000 range, th that's almost always going to cut in your favor. They're going to look at any other financial resources, so if you have savings or things like that. They're going to look at your education and skills, which for nurses, that's, that's massively in your favor. You're in a, uh, you know, you're in a high-skilled occupation, and you, you've got a lot of uh, schooling. And they're going to look for, uh, the sixth is they're going to look at what your visa classification you're applying for. And as Carl says, that's going to really cut against maybe the family-based cases, but cut in favor of all the employment-based. So you can see in all six, well, and then the seventh is something called an affidavit of support, which is actually, uh, it's so favorable, it's actually irrelevant in employment cases. So if you go through all seven, all of them are really going to cut in favor of, uh, of all of the nurses. So okay. but like Jacob and Carl, I, I'm optimistic that this is, this may be a little more paperwork needs to be put together, but ultimately it shouldn't lead into a visa refusal. Yeah. Well, and the, one thing is that not, the, the one thing <laughs> okay, is if somebody is not qualified, they're going to allow them to post, to post a bond of some sort. So, you know, there's hope. There's hope. Okay. We like hope. We like optimism. That's good. Okay. We are almost out of time. And I, I really apologize to everybody because we haven't been able to get to all the individual questions. Um, but keep them coming. We will try to get to as many as possible, um, especially in the next sessions. Um, it's just that there was a lot of um, changes in from a legislation perspective in the last month. So we, want to, we wanted to cover that more than the individual questions this month. Um, okay, so I'm going to give one or two more questions. So we have uh, Nelia, who's from the Philippines, live in Ohio. Hi, Nelia. And I'm in Ohio, Nelia. I know. <laughs> there you go. You are living it's close by. The in, the, out there, as a in, in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, Hannah is um, asking, okay, so this is a question that we're also getting from quite a few people. Um, I just wanted to ask if what we will do if, or any actions to take if the 60 to 90 days have already been passed since DQ and the priority date is current, and the NBC has not sent an interview date. This is under uh, Montreal. Chris, are you waving your hand? You I waving was waving my hand for oh. Ohio. Oh, <laughs> At the corner of my eye, I just saw the hand going. <laughs> I was like, do you want to take that question, Chris? <laughs> sure. So as I understood it, the question is I'm documenter documentarily qualified yes. for the and last date and I haven't heard from Montreal yet. After 60 to 90 days. Yeah. I, 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 I assume she means that she's submitted the documents to I the NBC. So. Yeah, I don't think 60 to 90 days is unusual at all. Normally, it's 12 to 15 weeks. So uh, I would probably wait another 30 days before I would uh, start to uh, maybe escalate this issue. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mike has posted a question. What if the immediate relative mother in U.S. is, an undoc is undocumented? since 2001, will that affect my application for the EB-3? Shall I declare it or not on the DS-260? Well, I mean, yeah, of course, you have, you, you have to tell the truth uh, on there. If you have an undocumented uh, mother in the US, you have to, you have to say that. Um, yeah, it shouldn't have any effect on immigrating to the US. If you were, if you were gonna try to get a tourist visa or a student visa and they saw that you had a close relative like that, that was living undocumented, you'd probably have a lot of problems. But in your case, no, I don't think there'll be any problems. And once you get the green card, make sure you apply for uh, citizenship when you're eligible, because then as, uh, as long as your mother came to the US 
legally, even though she overstayed her visa, she would be able to adjust her status and get a green card through you eventually. Oh, wow, well, I didn't know yeah. that. Okay, well, we, we live and learn, right? That's why we have the experts on the panel. <laughs> we are out of time, everybody. Thank you so much for to everybody who's watching. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to more of the questions. We will continue on this process. Um, thank you to Carl, Jacob, and Chris for your um, your expertise. Um, we, we know how busy you are and we really appreciate your time. And we wish everybody a, a good weekend and we will see you next month. Thank you guys. Bye, thank, you. Bye. Bye. thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>